thanks Mary for that introduction. I'm just trying to oh, here it is. Great. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much to uh, BioCan RX for the uh, opportunity to chat with you folks today. Um, we're going to spend the next 20 to 25 minutes talking about uh, how technologies are uh, adopted into the Ontario healthcare system and 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 how they're what criteria we use to reimburse them. Uh, hopefully, you'll learn a little bit along the way about uh, Health Quality Ontario and. Uh, the role that agency plays in um, in the adoption pathway, and a little bit about the process of something called health technology assessment, um, which is uh, a way of evaluating the evidence to uh, determine whether uh, a technology is uh, beneficial to patients um, and is also a good use of our public resources. So when I was doing a little bit of homework to prepare for this, um, I went on to the B3 workshop website um, and I wanted to understand well, who will I be speaking to today. Um, and uh, I came across the paragraph on who should attend. And it really was the first, uh, the first uh, sentence that caught my attention. Uh, not so much about the introductory overview, but um, more so about the er area of translating a therapeutic discovery to benefit a patient. And it's really the last the latter part of that sentence where uh, my team and where Health Quality Ontario uh, does the focus of its work, and that's in trying to figure out how these technologies that have taken years and years and years to develop, uh, how they eventually and effectively are benefiting the patient. And um, I like to think of the whole uh, research translation pathway of one uh, about does it work? So in the early stages, um, all the research and development is looking at does the technology um, do what we hope it's going to do? And, and I'm sure along the way there's many failures and redesigns in order to, to make that happen. And then it moves into something uh, called does it matter? If we use it, is it really having a big impact? On the, on the patient's quality of life, on their quality of care? Is it creating a meaningful change in the patient's day-to-day -day life? Um, and that can be patients like little Emily Whitehead here, who in 2012 was diagnosed with leukemia with a very grim outlook. Um, and she participated in a clinical trial in a hospital down in Philadelphia with CAR, uh, CAR T-cell therapy, which I'm sure folks here know much more than I do about. Um, and today, six years later, she is 12 and she's living a disease-free uh, life. So inarguably, a huge impact and a meaningful um, outcome for this little girl. So as the provincial advisor on quality of health care, um, Health Quality Ontario has a vision of better health for every Ontarian, as well as developing excellent quality of health care. And I think to echo um, Paul's comment, um, the previous speaker, we don't do this alone. Um, success doesn't happen in isolation. And uh, to build a better health care system, we have to partner with the folks in the system like yourselves who are starting at the innovation stage. Um, right through to the clinical researchers, uh, right through to the people who give clinical care, and importantly, um, to the patients who are receiving the care. Um, and it's together with the, in that partnership that we're trying to bring about these meaningful uh, improvements in health care. Um, we're, we're so charged about trying to bring quality into the healthcare system that we've boldly gone forward and developed a framework um, outlining lining the six uh, criteria or characteristics of a system, healthcare system, that, has, that is a, a culture of quality. And these were adopted from the Institute of Medicine, and, and, and they're basically uh, six very, very profound, I think, but uh, very important elements that say a, a quality, a healthcare system that is based on quality healthcare is safe, provides safe care, it provides effective care, it is patient-centered, uh, it provides effective healthcare that is efficient use of public funds and public resources. It provides timely health care, and it provides health care that's equitable. 
So much of the work that Health Quality Ontario uh, does is mandated and set out in the Excellent Care for All Act, which is a, a provincial act which was uh, proclaimed in 2010. Um, and through that act, we have uh, a number of obligations. And one is to monitor and report to the people of Ontario um, on the quality indicators and if Ontario healthcare system is hitting its targets for quality health care. It's also to support um, continued quality improvement. It's also to promote uh, the engagement with patients to, so we can get that vision of a of, of quality health care system. And finally, it's, based, it's to promote uh, health care that's supported by evidence. And we realize that uh, obligation by evaluating promising innovations and practices in our health technology assessment program. Now, health technology assessment is uh, a, 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 it's, it's a multidisciplinary policy research framework which um, includes uh, looking at various uh, aspects of a technology, the effectiveness, the cost effectiveness, the patient preferences and values, um, the, the uh, equity issues involved in adopting and delivering this specific intervention into the healthcare system. So I'm going to take you through an example of one, um, and this could be uh, you can think in the back of your mind when I'm talking about this, about an intervention that you're, you're contemplating right now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it might be five or ten years away from um, bringing it into clinical practice. But at the end of the day, we have to figure out how that intervention is going to matter to people, how it's going to change their lives. So this is our patient who woke up yesterday and was having a good day till about, about noon when he started to get a bit of blurred vision, a bit of drooping in the side of his face, a bit of slurred speech, um, and wasn't feeling too great. His friends whisked him off to the hospital. Indeed, after a bit of diagnostic evaluation, he was told that he has a clot in a vessel in his brain. And this clot was causing the blood flow to be, uh, to, to, to be interrupted, so parts of his brain were not receiving enough oxygen. This is known to most people as a stroke. Um, so the treatment, current treatment in Ontario for folks that are having this clot in, the, in, in their brain is to get an intravenous medicine called a thrombolytic. Um, and this goes into the, their, their systemic um, uh, blood system up to the brain and breaks apart the clot, clot goes away, the, the uh, uh, blood flow is restored to the part of the brain and hopefully the uh, devastating effects of, of the stroke are gone. The problem is there's, an there's a couple of things. They, they, the medicine is very good, but there's an optimal time to actually, optimal window with which we can receive that medicine. And the other thing is if clots get stuck in a very large vessel in the brain, uh, there is not a good effect of these clot-busting um, treatments. So along comes um, an innovation uh, called a uh, stent retriever, um, which can do a procedure called a mechanical thrombectomy. And essentially, you put a guide wire into the vessel of the brain, it reaches out, it grabs the clot, pulls the clot back, no more clot, good blood flow, no more stroke. And the big question that then comes to Health Quality Ontario is, should patients be treated with this new treatment for stroke, this mechanical thrombectomy? And then how do we decide if we want to use public funds to pay for this so it can be available for all folks in Ontario. So, you know, I'm sure you heard a lot about the idealized innovation pathway today, basic science, um, research and development, clinical trials, regulatory approval, adoption, post-marketing clinical trials, now getting a little bit of a new spin called real-world evidence. Um, my world sits down uh, at the funding decision and deciding how we optimally lose, use these interventions. So we're relying on a lot of information that's already been done to help us make that decision. And it's important that the folks that are doing the 5, 10, and 15 years before it gets to our group are thinking about what we need when we are considering the information we're going to need when we're considering how to fund uh, and how to use these technologies. 
The excellent care for all act um, actually gives uh, health quality the uh, Ontario the opportunity to make recommendations based on this evidence, and we make those recommendations to the Ministry uh, of Health, the government of Ontario, um, and the recommendations uh, advise the Ministry of Health on whether they ought to fund um, a treatment or not fund a treatment, and this is based on the evidence that we review. In considering funding recommendations, we also have to consider the public resources, so that efficiency part of a quality health care system, um, we have to take that into consideration when we're asking ourselves, should we put public dollars into funding this technology? So I'll just uh, to a little bit of um, level setting, and like we talk, use this word technology all the time, um, and I heard it, it indeed as I was listening to the previous speaker, and I was happy about that because I always get asked, well, what is a technology? Is it is, are you working with computers, or are you just working with widgets and gadgets? In fact, um, it's it's an it's a term whose history is uh, about 40, 50 years old now, um, but it essentially is any treatment for a, to, for a health care condition. Um, it can be a drug, it can be a vaccine, um, it can be a test to screen or diagnose a patient, it can be a surgical procedure or a way of delivering uh, a care uh, in the health care system. Uh, at Health Quality Ontario, we do evaluate everything on there except drugs and vaccines. That is done um, in, with our other partners within the Ministry of Health. So in order to complete a health technology assessment, we actually first have to identify what technologies are out there. And that is done through an application process uh, on our website. And anybody in Ontario can put in an application. So a patient, we can have industry, we can have um, a researcher or clinician, uh, and it's a quick form to fill out, and it basically is identi identifying for us the, the technology, what it's used for, um, why you want an HTA uh, assessment, and it's usually because uh, the, there's n funding does not exist currently for the technology. We think it's better than the current treatment. Um, we think there's evidence out there to show a benefit to patients, um, and we hopefully, through that evaluation, uh, we'll get public funding um, recommendation for that technology. We get about um, 30 applications a year, um, and that's more than we can actually resource uh, and do it to do a health technology assessment. Uh, so we have to prioritize these topics, and it's not an easy decision to make because arguably every topic is important to a patient um, in Ontario. But we do, we do get a f heads around the table. Um, we have a way of prior prioritizing it based on 10 criteria. And once that's done, the topics that are at the top of the list will go, f go into our HTA development process. I'll talk a little bit about um, the components of an HTA in the next slide. The, once an HTA is developed, that package of information is uh, presented to our Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee, or OTAC, as we call it. And they're a group of, uh, right now, 18 uh, pretty wise people that sit around the table. Um, they have backgrounds in, in epidemiology and uh, health economics. They're clinicians, they're administrators. Um, and uh, they weigh up and deliberate the benefits and the risks um, and the value for money of these technologies. And based on that deliberation, they'll make a draft recommendation on whether to fund uh, with public dollars the technology and whether to adopt it in Ontario or not. The draft recommendation is uh, posted on our website um, for public comment. Um, and indeed, if you go to our website, you can sign up for alerts for those to come to your uh, email so you can reply back to uh, our draft recommendations and let us know whether we got it right, whether we got it wrong, or in fact, whether we got it partly right, and maybe there's a better way of actually framing um, the, uh, the recommendation. This information is then brought back to OTAC, and in consideration of that public comment, OTAC will either revise the recommendation or, um, or ratify the draft recommendation as final. The final recommendation is required to be approved by the Board of Directors of uh, Health Quality Ontario, and once that's done, 
the package of information, the evidentiary package, or the health technology assessment report, and the recommendation is sent to our Minister of Health for his consideration. Um, and he can choose to accept the recommendation and act uh, in, in accordance with that recommendation, or based on his decision making, can choose to reject. We've been very fortunate so far. We seem to have gotten it right, and uh, most of the all of the recommendations we've put forward have been accepted so far. Talked a little bit about that middle box of what is an HTA and what do we consider when we're developing um, that evidentiary uh, piece. Um, I like to think of I, I like to think of an HTA as actually a mutual fund because it's got really buckets of information. Um, we talked about the effectiveness about it having that really patient. Uh, you know, relevant outcome benefit. Um, another aspect of it is looking at the value for money. And this is a, a very important uh, aspect because it speaks to if we adopt this technology, are we going to be able to use our resources efficiently? And more importantly, um, why we do that is because for every technology we, every technology we adopt with public funds, it means we're not going to adopt another one. Okay, there's an opportunity cost to paying for one technology, means perhaps another technology will not be affordable down the road. So we have to be very uh, careful um, when we're making um, uh, commitments with public dollars. Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're getting technologies that um, are really good value for the money we're spending. We do speak with patients, and I think this is the real partnership aspect aspect of our work, we talk with patients to understand the lived experience. Um, we talk with patients to understand what treatments they have used uh, in the past, um, the pros and the cons, the barriers to receiving treatment. Um, and um, through those preference and values, we're, we're able to contextualize the evidence to really understand what outcomes are important to patients, what difficulties they have in getting treatments, what are the needs for uh, their treatment needs? We do have an equity focus, so we want to make sure that um, if something is effective, that we are uh, we are looking to say to see whether um, folks across all sorts of uh, patient characteristics are able to achieve that same outcome um, with the technology um, as as folks with different outcomes. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not having any inequity in care if we adopt the technology. Clinical experts are uh, valuable input into our work. They help us understand the, uh, the they contextualize the, the patient um, care management pathway. They help us understand the pathophysiology of the healthcare um, condition. Um, they also help us understand what barriers are out there um, to care and the complexities of the care. Importantly, too, we also um, engage with industry. Um, behind every technology, uh, arguably most technologies that are like, like the mechanical uh, thrombectomy um, stent, um, there, there's a, an industry that actually developed this. And they're marketing it, and they have a lot of great insight into how this works. And so we, we do meet with them so they can understand what we are doing, um, and we can understand a little bit more about um, often the genesis or the development of the technology. And I'll just move on. Um, so let's go back to our stamp retriever. The, ba the, the question was, should we use this? Should we use it for this patient um, that's in need of it right now? And then should we actually publicly fund it for everybody in Ontario? And this was a real question that came to us about a year and a half ago. And we looked at the evidence for effectiveness from the published literature. And from the clinical trials, now I'm not too sure if everybody's familiar with a forest plot. And uh, let's see, it wasn't working earlier. Huh? Here, I got, was I in luck? Mm, no, it's a little... A little finickety. But um, so forest plot is just a way of representing all the, all the uh, data in a, in a, in a graphical way. Um, and every blue dot on the right-hand side of the graph is really the, the mean uh, 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 data point of, of, the, uh, of the study. 
Um, and the horizontal line is really the variance, so the dispersion of the data. Um, and, and statistically, what happens is we aggregate all these together, uh, and we come out with a uh, pooled estimate of whether folks who are receiving the mechanical thrombectomy are actually doing better than folks who are receiving the current treatment, which is just the drug that, that busts up the clot. And the outcome here is mortality, which is a very important and relevant outcome for patients. And what we find is it, for, if the folks that are getting the mechanical thrombectomy are doing no worse than the folks that are getting the clot busting treatment. So there's they're, they're, they're a reduction in mortality, but it's not significant. So they're, they're not having a greater reduction in mortality than folks who are getting the clot busting treatment. Okay, so, you know, would have been more impressive if they were, but not too bad. But then we come along with the second outcome, and this is func functional independence um, after a stroke. And what we find is folks that are getting uh, the mechanical thrombectomy are actually having twice the ability to recover their function after a stroke and after being treated with a mechanical thrombectomy than folks who are just getting the clot-busting drug. This is a huge impact, a huge relevant outcome, um, and um, very, very important effect of this new treatment. So based on that, uh, we went and we said, looks pretty good. Folks who get the mechanical thrombectomy actually have, can recover um, their independence, functional independence, a bit more often than folks who are just getting the drug. And their mortality is no different, which is, which is good. Then we go on to ask, is this good value for money? And so this is what's called a cost-effectiveness plane. And across the x-axis is um, the uh, effect, measurement of the effect. And the y-axis is a measurement of the cost. And we have a blue triangle right there, which is an average estimate of all those micro simulations. And that blue triangle says that it's going to cost us about $12,000 more to use the mechanical thrombectomy to get uh, an, a, more, a better health. Okay, so we get better health when we use the mechanical thrombectomy, but we're going to pay for that. We're going to have to pay a little bit more for better health. And the amount we're going to pay, the incremental amount we're going to pay is $12,000. Now, do you think that's good? Or do you think that's expensive? Great? Yeah, as it turns out, it is great. Um, the, the, the OTAC committee doesn't have a threshold they use for measuring cost effectiveness. Um, conventionally, uh, and in other jurisdictions around the world, $50,000 per, per, per effect, something called the quality of life years gained, uh, $50,000 to pay for better health is around the world and other jurisdictions, the, the threshold. This is markedly under that. You can see the, the green uh, diagonal line represents the willingness for people, public, to pay uh, for uh, $50,000 to get better health. Um, and that blue dot is well under that. So it turns out that this is a highly cost-effective treatment. So after considering all that evidence, Health, the, uh, Health Quality Ontario, advised by OTAC, recommended that we publicly fund um, these stent retrievers um, so that patients in Ontario could receive mechanical thrombectomy treatment um, across Ontario with public dollars. Um, we do a number of technologies um, it, it, in our health technology assessment program. Here's a bit of a list of what we're working on right now. Uh, I've bolded a few of them just to show you that it's across different uh, types of technologies. Uh, home delivery of subcutaneous immunoglobulin. This is uh, our, uh, a, a, we're evaluating a uh, service delivery model and whether that service delivery model is more effective and is more cost effective and is more preferable to patients. And if this is how we should deliver immunoglobulin therapy in Ontario um, versus having folks go into the, a clinic hospital to receive this IV therapy. 
Um, Non-invasive prenatal testing is a diagnostic test. Uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, a surgical procedure. So, um, and, and then you see there's a, a few uh, specific uh, di other diagnostic tests and um, different uh, uh, devices um, like cochlear implants and retinal prosthesis. Lots of challenges in evaluating technologies for reimbursement and, um, and adoption into Ontario. One is what's, we struggle with what's the optimal time point to evaluate the technology. Too early in its development often leads to uh, um, inefficient um, uh, evidence and it, we're, it's, we're unable actually to make a recommendation and it usually ends up being uh, don't fund recommendation because we just don't have enough. There's too much uncertainty as to whether this technology is actually having the patient benefit that we want and is cost effective. Conversely, too late in the diffusion of the technology means that uh, stuff gets into the healthcare system uh, which may not be effective and may not be efficient and it's very hard to pull things out of the system once it's in. Um, are we reviewing the right technologies? Well, I talked a little bit about the prioritization process we have. And um, it's a difficult process, um, but I think it's an important process because uh, determining um, re the relevancy of, of, uh, of a technology um, to, because it takes a while to develop a health technology assessment, it's very important that we're actually working on and evaluating topics that are relevant. So always a challenge on determining what that relevant topic is. Um, involving patients in our work is uh, central to um, what Health Quality Ontario does, and we're always looking for better ways and more robust ways to engage patients to understand what's meaningful to them. Uh, we have a new file, and that's to review genetic tests. Um, we have the Ontario uh, Genetic Advisory Committee, which is a subcommittee to OTAC, and uh, their mandate is to review genetic tests and advise again on which tests ought to be recommended in the province. Genetic tests, uh, a, a, a huge, huge area of development, huge areas of research, huge turnover, very fast. And the challenge there is to keep up with the number of tests that are coming to market every day. Um, rare conditions can be a challenge in terms of our value framework we use to make our decisions. Uh, and the uh, supporting uh, efforts to reduce uncertainty. I talked a little bit early, uh, earlier about the optimal time to evaluate a technology. Um, and oftentimes uh, when we evaluate the evidence and there's a, a lot of uncertainty on whether this technology works or not, the question is how do we reduce that uncertainty so uh, we, we can make a decision in maybe in a year's time. And for that we rely on the researchers um, to hopefully do the proper clinical trials with the meaningful outcomes. So when we are reviewing um, the evidence, uh, we can, we actually, the uncertainty is reduced. Uh, and we're very certain, we become very certain about the benefit to the patient. Um, <clears throat> finally, you know, uh, there are lots of uh, HTA partners across uh, Canada, uh, indeed nationally and internationally, um, there are more technologies to, to evaluate than any one agency can actually um, take on. And we have to look for efficiencies in actually carrying out these HTA evaluations so we can keep up with uh, the number of technologies that are coming to market and, and potentially being very beneficial and also very efficient use of resources. Um, the final thing is linking funding recommendations to implementation. So uh, where we may say fund, we, we, we think it should be publicly funded, um, the question then it goes from there, how do we then implement that recommendation? Um, how do we actually get it into the system? And for that we turn to our partners at the Ministry uh, of Health in order to um, plan out the implementation and uh, you know bring it to the down to, uh, to the patient, um, where, where it, it ideally is where the effect should be. Um, I'll stop there.